Okay, uh, hello guys, thank you for being here. Uh, so my name is Max, I'm founder and CEO of Vault12. And uh, what we're going to chat about today is a cornerstone of the platform we're building, uh, social recovery, uh, which is uh, key to our approach how to safeguard cryptocurrencies in a decentralized and distributed way. So, um, first of all, uh, we need to chat uh, why uh, we need social recovery. What is, uh, what is the problem? And um, obviously, uh, kind of as all we know, the key challenge for everybody who holds any form of crypto assets is how you securely store assets uh, that are absolutely unrecoverable if you ever lose your private keys, uh, that are absolutely unreversible if um, attackers uh, steal your Bitcoin on other cryptocurrencies, there is no way to reverse these transactions. And obviously all of you know the basics and you all know how we arrived to uh, current uh, point of our technological evolution, that pretty much no matter what you're using, you're using hardware wallet, you're using software wallet, uh, the uh, final artifact that you're currently storing as form of your digital money of the internet uh, is some crumpled piece of paper that you keep in your bank safe deposit boxes, uh, which is, of course, uh, fundamentally is ridiculous. So interestingly enough, uh, on our own team, we had uh, some exposure to bank safe deposit boxes since one of our team members was living in Greece during a Greek banking crisis. Uh, and as any responsible Bitcoin owner, he was keeping his paper wallets in ba bank safe deposit boxes. So uh, to much surprise to all of us, uh, when government shut down national banking system due to the crisis, uh, it turns out they shut down access to safe deposit boxes exactly the same way. So if uh, any of you here uh, keep your Bitcoin in uh, uh, bank safe deposit boxes paper wallet, uh, I admire your face into a uh, banking system because you're basically betting that banks will never have a crisis and your bank safe deposit boxes uh, will stay open. So now, uh, other aspects that uh, we always have to consider, especially for those of us living in California, that uh, our bank safe deposit boxes might end up being too open, uh, especially vertically open, and geographical separation is a super important concern. So if you live, say, in Palo Alto in your bank safe deposit box in Mountain View, well, you're basically living on exactly the same fault lines. And uh, when the next California big one hits, uh, probably all your Bitcoin paper wallets will be in exactly the same pile of rubble as is your house, is your office, etc. So if you don't have uh, any geographical separation of the assets, uh, the risk factor is pretty much the same. So in short, uh, can we have can we have a better solution to all of this? Uh, can we uh, avoid these uh, weird pieces of paper uh, or embedding uh, hardware chips into our body parts? Like uh, that image in yellow, it's not a joke. You can research it. You can inject Bitcoin private keys into your hands. Uh, and uh, that's what people have been doing in the past as one of the few secure ways to store Bitcoin. Um, not compatible with Sherry Allo. They cut your hands off if you commit crimes, so not going to work there. Um, so what we're going to kind of uh, discuss is entirely different approach that we call social storage and recovery. And uh, we have two parts for you. One is a little bit more mathematical, uh, another is social. So I will start with uh, technical background first. So uh, everything is based on uh, old uh, algorithm, very well known uh, proven cryptographic algorithm called Shamir Secret Sharing, which is part of cryptographic family called threshold cryptography. And uh, uh, the key element, what you see here, is that you don't see any private of public keys. It's totally different cryptographic stack that uh, popular PKI you're all familiar with. Here, uh, every secret gets uh, distributed and to so-called shards, and we're going to chat in a moment what those shards are. And once you have threshold number of shards uh, collected again, you can restore your original secrets. So uh, let's go into a bit more specific example. Let's suppose you're Batman, and you need to give emergency access to your bat cave. It's still your cave. You don't want to just give access to everybody. But what if you are kidnapped and <clears throat> your group, meaning uh, Robin, Commissioner Gordon, Batgirl, they need to go to Batcave, get weapons, get Batmobile, and rescue you back. 
So Batman creates these shards of his emergency key access to the Batcave. And every shard does not actually betray any information about the secret. It's completely useless in isolation. But if you combine the shards together, uh, they will recombine into whatever was that emergency key access Batman provided. So, uh, as uh, you may know, that all biggest uh, crypto custody providers, Coinbase, uh, Vinclavis Capital, they all use Shamir secret sharing internally. And why everybody likes this approach so much is because of certain property uh, that Shamir secret sharing shards um, have. And that property is so-called theoretical security, which means uh, even if you have infinite number of quantum computers, you cannot break uh, that shard. That shard does not betray any piece of information about your original secret. So if Joker gets, uh, for example, Joker kidnaps bad girl, gets her phone and gets one shard, uh, he uh, learns exactly zero bits of information even if, if he had infinite amount of quantum computers. Uh, interestingly enough, that's actually stronger security guarantee, that security guarantee of cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies are so-called computationally secure. That means you need a insane number of computers to ever brute for them, but this is a limited number. It numbers that enough computers to fill the whole universe, but still it's a limited number. So Shamir secret sharing uh, is one of those unique cryptographic algorithms that uh, that number is probably infinite. It's no matter how many resources you spend trying to crack secrets, you get absolutely nowhere. So uh, think about how we used launch nuclear missiles in, uh, in the past uh, with so-called two-man rule, like early form of uh, two-factor authentication. So with this approach, you shifting to n-factor authentication and your authentication and data access actually becomes merged together. Because every time right now you use two-factor authentication, you always access some sort of centralized server. Uh, because that server, that's what actually keeping secret and two-factor is just a kind of complicated lock uh, on that door. When you use Shamir secret sharing, uh, kind of as you recall, the, uh, the data is in the shards. There is no central server holding your shards. Uh, so the fact uh, of authentication automatically grants you access to the data, but you don't need to build any centralized infrastructure uh, to hold that information protected by this n-factor algorithm. So that's the uh, technical part. So now let's talk about social part, uh, kind of why we kind of arrive into this point. In uh, the core issue that we have today, and of course it was not... Um, immediate its results of decade-old um, tendencies. But the key problem is that after a uh, crisis of 2008, uh, which of course led, uh, famously led to creation of Bitcoin next year, is that we have complete erosion of trust of higher level governments and organizations. Right now, nobody after 2008, nobody in the right mind will ever say that government has your best interests in heart uh, or Wall Street has your best interests in heart. That trust is completely destroyed. So as a result, we kind of going back to medieval ages that you only trust yourself and your own tools and kind of as we discussed, this is actually incredibly hard to build any sort of uh, protective schema using your own uh, personal tools. So there is a missing link. And of course, that missing link is actually your family and friends, uh, which instinctively is completely obvious. If you want somebody to store spare key to your house, you don't ask Goldman Sachs for that, you ask your neighbor. Uh, if you have family emergency and need a quick loan, uh, you basically ask your friend and relative uh, for a quick IOU note. In, uh, Every one of us has the social capital that they can leverage. The only thing that was missing until recently, uh, we basically missed a, a hardware platform to deploy such solution. And uh, everything I'm saying right now, it's possible only because we're already carrying these extremely powerful crypto computers that come in with integrated authentication, security, encrypted storage that allow us to deploy this kind of uh, personal peer-to-peer -peer network uh, centered about each individual user. So uh, 
Overall, uh, the plan is actually pretty simple. So obviously, let's stop using these uh, crumpled pieces of paper. And uh, kind of for many people, including myself, uh, let's not use centralized vendors that just recreate legacy banking system uh, on top of crypto instead of fiat currency, but have all the kind of negative toxic properties of uh, legacy banking system. And uh, just like uh, our example with uh, Batman uh, emergency key, let's keep uh, the secrets into this mist between devices, that your secrets actually not going to exist anywhere. There is no single server in the world where secret going to exist. It will exist only as shard distributed between uh, people you select yourself. So how it works practically? Uh, actually, it's pretty simple. Uh, you recruit your friends and family if you're doing it for yourself uh, in personal environment. Uh, if you're inside organization, you can base it on roles and liabilities. Obviously, if somebody has a uh, legal uh, liability for protecting assets or even fiduciary responsibility, they could be directly involved in securing these assets. Uh, you can create policy, and for people who see in multi-sig in actions, that will sounds very familiar. The key technical difference between uh, Shamir secret sharing and multi-signature schemas is that uh, it's incredibly much more faster and there are pretty much no limits. So you can trivially create a schema, something like 20 shards uh, needed for restoration out of 100 shards. And that schema will work at exactly the same speed as uh, kind of some of the simpler, uh, simpler schemas. So uh, what we recommend by default in our platform is uh, kind of beginning policy uh, requiring three or four shards out of five of 10 uh, created shards. Uh, but uh, it's completely flexible. It's pretty much up to you as an owner what sort of, or what sort of policy you're going to create. And obviously, more shards you have, uh, more robust your system becomes, because it's very hard to delete your data with so many shards stored around. And uh, then you put any sort of assets uh, on the platform, and every asset will look like this. It will be some sort of file or secret key or your seed derivation phrase. And you will see a list of guardians uh, who uh, kind of are guardian shards of that asset. And of course, guardians themselves, uh, they have no idea what's inside. A shard does not betray them any information. Uh, and when you need your, say, recovery phrase or private key back, uh, you you just contact threshold number of guardians, uh, kind of they send you this encrypted shard, uh, and that's it. You recovered your secret, do whatever you need with it, and erase it immediately afterward. Uh, so all of this is, uh, we call this concept of moving your assets into the mist. And the key part is, it's noticed that the uh, central part of that schema is actually empty because 99% uh, of the time, your file simply does not exist. Uh, it's spread in this mist, but there is no single place for hackers or hostile governments to attack. In uh, uh, that uh, social storage approach, uh, kind of has lots of uh, positive uh, properties, and uh, kind of I'm listing like only half here. Kind of uh, you can read up on our website more details, kind of and see full exposure uh, of this technology. Uh, but overall, it let us go away from these uh, legacy methods, uh, starting from uh, pieces of paper and some kind of self-made uh, hardcore self-storage solution, and then actually becomes pretty easy and manageable problem. Just uh, pick friends or family you trust, uh, recruit them in the application, and have them as your personal guardians, um, kind of as one of our investors said, you're effectively creating personal bank of yourself, and you're recruiting your friends to be vice president of that bank of you. And uh, all needed for that uh, is software. So uh, if you're interested in this topic, uh, feel free to go to our website. Uh, we have uh, early prototype demo, we have white paper, uh, and um, Get up since we have a short time slot here. I'm not going to take questions here from the stage, but feel free to approach me afterward, and uh, I'm happy to answer any of your questions. That is all we have. Uh, thank you very much, guys.